is Matthew Bannister. On Last Word this week, the Irish women's rights campaigner Dr Moira Woods, the film critic and documentary maker Ian Johnston, and Rita Lee, the singer known as Brazil's Queen of Rock. But first, Jeremy Clark entertained readers of The Spectator magazine with his low-life experiences for more than 20 years. His skill as a writer was all the more surprising because he left school with only two O-levels. For a decade and a half, he undertook a series of manual jobs, including working in a factory and as a refuse collector, jobs from which he was often sacked. In his column, he recalled another failed career. I remember one time, in a fit of madness, I stepped up and tried to join the bourgeoisie. I was mopping floors of a 500-bed mental hospital at the time. You seem like a good chap, they said. Would you like to train to be a registered mental nurse? I sat up and begged. Yes, please, I said. The training was three years on-the-job training, live in. I moved into the nurse's home, ate in the staff canteen, and drank in the social club. I then found out that when you live and work among psychotics, even as a mental nurse, you can easily forget what society outside the hospital gates deems to be normal behaviour. And once you forget that, then technically, you are what society calls mad. On a trip to Africa, Jeremy realised he was much better read than many of the graduates around him. So back in the UK, he passed some A-levels and secured a place at the School of African and Oriental Studies in London. He also attended English classes at the nearby University College London. David Goodhart gave him his first paid writing job. I saw a hilarious piece he'd written about one of his trips to Africa in a, in a student magazine, and I gave him this column. I had just started... This magazine still exists called Prospect. It's a, it's a quite a uh, heavyweight, rather earnest political monthly magazine. And he was this sort of shaft of lightness and wit in this otherwise rather dull magazine. And he began to be noticed. Uh, there was a famous English professor called Carl Miller who spotted him. He spotted him writing about ferret husbandry. Jeremy knew all sorts of things about <laughs> in all, all sorts of often rural matters that surprised people when they met him. The comedian, actor and writer Eric Idle was a friend of Jeremy's and a fan of his columns. He, he, he was such a fresh writer and he took it so seriously. You know, he really did. He, he taught himself to write. And whenever I was down or couldn't, I, was, I hated writing he, he would say, oh, I know, I just sent another pile of something to the spectator, you know, rubbish. I'm going off to a World War I cemetery to cheer up. In the year 2000, the deputy editor of The Spectator, Stuart Reid, invited Jeremy to take on the magazine's low-life column. It was a column that was established many years ago. A man called Geoffrey Barnard made it famous back in the 80s and 90s. It was done somewhat differently by Jeremy, but it was about the trials and tribulations of kind of life at, not exactly at the kind of bottom, but the sort of raffish, ne'er-do-wells life, I think is perhaps the best way of describing it. And was Jeremy a raffish, ne'er-do-well? Yes, I think he probably was, really. <laughs> he, was, he was always up for a, for a good time. I think that's the great thing about low life. You know, you, you are the one supposed to be enjoying it. You know, that high life, forget it. You know, you know, nobody needs a yacht to enjoy yourself. But a low life... Everybody's got a low life, you know, go in the pub and see some friends. And it was more like real life, actually. I was a bit late when I pushed my shoulders back and shoved open the door of the coffee shop. My date was already in there, talking to another man in a green shirt. Dido's No Angel was playing on the CD. I can't sleep, I can't breathe, Dido was singing, till you're resting here with me. I took my latte over to their table and joined them. My blind date tore herself away from her new friend to talk to me, but only from civility. Evidently, she and the bloke in the green shirt had connected in some way. She'd assumed he was me, she said, looking at me with undisguised contempt, because of his green shirt. But, as Sharon's mum had said, self-confidence is all, and I had none. So I stood up, pointlessly shook hands with both of them and came home again. And presumably he had to live a low life. He obviously had experiences, which he detailed in the column, of of hanging out with all sorts of different types of people in nightclubs and waking up in the middle of the night, you know, having slept in the gutter. And, you know, he, he definitely was quite a loose figure, wasn't he? He was. This was actually the life he was leading. And it wasn't always a happy one. I mean, you know, he, he, he drank far too much. He took drugs. I think a, there was a kind of an insecurity, perhaps, at the heart of him, which may account for the fact that we don't have 
a Jeremy novel, unless there's one hidden in a bottom drawer somewhere, that perhaps he didn't have the self-belief that some other less talented writers often do. But writing was what kind of held him together. There's so, there's so much writing that will not survive. This is just for our own time. And ostensibly, this is just a weekly magazine. But I think his pieces, you can read them any time. And, and, and you immediately see this character. You don't feel he's a great person. He, he just feels he's going to make another mess here or things are always going to go wrong again. So that's a very English thing, I think. He may have been a very English writer, but Jeremy found happiness in his later years in France. He'd moved there with the love of his life, Catriona Olding, who he first met when she entered a spectator competition to find the most tasteless joke. They had a contented existence, entertaining friends and sharing a deep love for literature. But then Jeremy was diagnosed with cancer. Typically, he wrote about it in his column. I've never seen anybody describe their own death and the progress and slow, painful path to their own demise than Jeremy. I think being able to describe that process which everybody has to undergo with humour and wit and in, ter in terrible pain, it was, it was actually, you know, some kind of sainthood, I think. <laughs> Three times a week, I lie on the floor and pretend to be dead. Shavasana, or corpse pose, is the concluding pose of the Ashtanga Yoga sentence I'm learning down at the local yoga centre. Basically, Ashtanga Yoga consists of spending two hours trying to put your nose up your bottom from every conceivable angle, then quarter of an hour lying supine on the floor as if the effort has finally killed you. In my case, it often very nearly has. I'm such a natural at the corpse pose that my yoga teacher has even complimented me on it. It was the first compliment he'd given me. I was well chuffed. But as I was pretending to be dead at the time, I didn't acknowledge it. Jeremy Clark, who's died aged 66.